All right, well, hey, welcome officially to Marathon Mindset. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this. So this is a, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so this is a topic that is, man, it's super, super uh, important to me, this idea of perseverance and longevity, and I'm assuming that you're here because it's important to you too. Um, so here's the thing, whether you're here because maybe your youth pastor signed you up to be here, <laughs> or you're here because you've got like some difficult situation in life, you're facing something with your family, maybe you're here and you just want to be a person who like, who like follows through with the things you're going to say you're going to do, or, you know, maybe you're here because you just want to run this race of life and do it well and make it to the finish line and hear those famous words like, well done, good and faithful, uh, whatever it is, uh, I think there's something here in the micro and in the macro for you uh, to, to just help you like live that life um, of perseverance and longevity and how to just kind of um, have that grit, right? Everybody say grit. 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 Yeah, and we want to help you just have that grit. So, um, Looking at me, you're going to quickly figure out that I don't run marathons. <laughs> I am not. You won't look at this guy and be like, oh, he is a marathon runner. It, it's not me. I'm not. Uh, but as we, as we um, got talking about this topic of perseverance and longevity uh, across the leadership here at Gateway, we all agreed that the best analogy we could give you uh, is this visual of a marathon runner. So fortunately... I know friends who are marathon runners. So I was like, hey guys, I need to pick your brain for a little bit. Help me get in your mind. Help me understand marathon running. Uh, I did a little bit of running when I was younger. My knee started giving me problems, so I quit running. And then all the weight came on, and that was that. So um, I would love to be a marathon runner, though. I think it's pretty cool. I have a lot of respect for marathon runners. And after talking with these guys, I have an even greater level of respect for them. So uh, I just want to jump into this. If you got something to take notes, pull it out now. Um, we're going to just kind of like, we got so much to get through today. I've got some great content for you and, uh, and I hope it's going to be super pragmatic. So I want to give you truth, but I also want to give you like the nuts and bolts, the how to's practical things that you can do, things you can surround your life with, um, actions you can take that's really going to help you persevere in uh, in the long run. So let me just kind of set up uh, the stage for this. Um, a quick search of the word perseverance in the Bible, you'll find that there are more than a hundred occurrences of perseverance or endurance in Scripture. You don't just a quick search will pull that up, and you'll see this is a big deal. This is this is um, something that Paul uh, writes a lot about in the Scriptures: is perseverance, endurance, finishing the race, fighting well. And frankly, I believe personally that perseverance is the is a root component um, of a faith that pleases God. I believe that it's, it is a base component, and I want to just sort of unpack this for a minute to, to build this case for why perseverance and longevity matter. Why does it matter that we stick to it and we have this don't quit attitude um, in life? And, and I really believe that without perseverance, you can't have faith. So let me just kind of build this case for you. There's going to be some scripture references come up on the screen. And I want you to look at this in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Uh, through him, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering. Here we go. Check this out. Here's a progression. It's a formula. Knowing that suffering produces endurance or perseverance. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Reading down, uh, on down to verse 5. Uh, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we see this formula that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope. Now, jump to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says that faith is the assurance of things what? Does anybody know? Yeah, or what? Hoped for. Hoped for. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. So suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character produces hope. Hope is the essence. It's the, the foundation of faith. You can't have faith without hope. 
And then looking a couple verses ahead in Hebrews 11.6, it says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So you can kind of see it, see it here. Suffering brings perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope is the essence of faith and without faith it is impossible to please God. So if you don't have perseverance, if you remove that from the chain, you cannot come to a place of hope, meaning you cannot come to a place of faith and you cannot please the Lord. So I believe that perseverance is fundamental, foundational. It's a base ingredient to having a faith that pleases God. So it, in other words, in simpler words, it honors God that we have perseverance. It honors God that we have that character, that grit within us, that we have this no-quit attitude. So let's just talk real briefly this, this afternoon, this morning, I guess still morning. I've got five points for you, five things um, that are going to help you live a life of perseverance and longevity. And we'll bring in a few visuals and stuff as we go. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time, I, literally I spent like two hours on the phone with a couple like active marathon runners. And I'm like, here's where I feel like I'm, God's leading me in this message. Tell me these points make sense or tell me these points are stupid. Help me build these things out. Just let me... Uh, anchor this in marathon running. And so I spent a lot of time just grinding through this and here's what we came up with together. So the first thing, if you want to write this down, how do you persevere? How do you have longevity? Is that you find community. Number one, you find community. This is super important. So why is community important? Because community brings accountability and encouragement. And you're going to see all kinds of notes, and we're going to kind of work through these, these individual points together. But community brings accountability and encouragement. So I was talking to these guys about marathon running, and, and one thing that they both said was the importance of having a coach and having fellow runners with them in the, in the process of building up for a, a marathon. And if you don't know how, how much a marathon... Uh, is 26 miles. So if you don't, if you don't have an idea of, of what that is, we're talking, this isn't like a sprint. This isn't like a track and field, like, you know, 100 meter dash, 400 meter. It's, it's a 26 mile run. Okay. There's a difference in your training from a, a track and field race to a marathon run. Okay. There is a point where your body literally shuts down and you have to power yourself through on mental strength. And so it's important that these components, so when we talk about life being like a race and it's like a marathon and you want to get to the end, get to that finish line and do well, you want to like get to that finish line and not collapse. You want to get to that finish line and still have life in you, right? And so one of the components, primary components is to have this community. So um, this one guy I, I, I talked to, his name's Jonathan Harper. Maybe some of you know him. He's a pastor here uh, in, in Northwest Michigan. And Jonathan has been running in marathons, uh, races since uh, college. It was a college sport for him. And Jonathan talks about how his coach helps drive him and challenge him and hold him accountable to his goals and that without a coach he would tend to get sloppy and lazy in his running uh, and and so that coach would help him remind him of these are the goals this is this is the long term this is what you want to hit this is your desired you know race your desired pace and 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 here's what you're going to have to do to get there and hey buddy you're you know you got to stop eating that pizza and and, and you've got to push yourself a little bit harder you've got to you've got to run a little bit faster today and 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 his coach would help drive him to achieve uh, those those uh, micro goals that were going to help him reach the finish line and reach it well so his, go his coach was constantly checking in, holding him to those goals. Um, and then he talked about how on a race team, you have, you know, teammates you're racing with. And it's really easy to start like competing against the guys that you're racing with. But it's also important, he said, to remember that on a race team, you're not racing each against each other. You're racing with each other. Like in a collective, yeah, you do have like your individual time and you want to you wanna reach, your, your reach that finish line with your personal best, but he's like, you also want to help the team achieve their best, right? And so 
Jonathan was talking about the importance of remembering that you're racing with other people and you're there to support and encourage and push each other to be the very best version of themselves, to go when they feel like quitting, um, to, to uh, you know, grit down when they feel like slowing uh, and, and holding them accountable uh, for, their, for, their, for their actions and their, and their choices. Like, hey man, you're, you're trying to reach this point in life and you're not going to get there if you don't build this character. If we start applying this to like real life and not just a race, we start applying this to real life. It's about having those friends around you who are going to say, hey, you're capable of so much more. Hey, I believe in you. Hey, I know you can achieve this goal. Hey, I know you can build this character. Hey, I know you can make this decision and I'm going to help you do it. And you have those people around you who support and uplift you. How many know what I'm talking about? How many got those people in your life right now that they push you to be the best version of yourself that you possibly can? I'm telling you that is important for longevity. Because there's going to be a point in time where you're going to get tired. You're going to let your guard down. Um, you're going to make mistakes. You may even trip and fall and, and screw up big time. You may hurt relationships that you have, hurt people around you. And it's going to be those people that are going to help get you up and keep you moving. Without those people, you're going to have the tendency just to stay down. And wow, I screwed up and there's no recovering from this. But those people are going to help pull you and, 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 and push you and, and make you a better version of yourself. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, it says there. It says this, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. And in the context of this scripture, this is important for us to grab. In the context of this scripture, um, uh, Paul is actually writing about the last days of the church. Like in the days leading up to Jesus' return, when things are going to get wild and crazy, when, when uh, the world is just going to come, come loose and there's going to be just wickedness and unrighteousness and there's going to be hatred, uh, just rampant in the streets. Paul is like, encourage one another and build one another up. That is the role of the church. That's how you're going to rise. That's how you're going to stand out. That's how you're going to cross this finish line uh, and, and, and do it well. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Let me say that again. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. There's power in community, having those people uh, around you to support you and push you. Let me give you one more verse, and then we'll just draw a quick application. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brothers, if any one of you is caught in any sort of transgression or sin, you who are spiritual should restore him uh, in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, he says, and so fulfilling the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks that he is something when he's nothing, he's deceiving himself. But let each one test his own work. Then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. It's this idea that he writes that we're to, we're to carry, support one another, support one another's burdens, and even correct one another in gentleness. That's, in, that's a key word there, gentleness. That, that the, the, the role of your community is to point out when you're wrong. Look, you don't need people around you who are always going to tell you like, oh, it's okay, you're all right. You'll do better. You do you. You know, you don't need those yes men around you. You need people who are willing to confront you and challenge you when you're, when you're wrong, when you're off, off, off track. But they're also willing to do it in gentleness and in love, right? That's, that's the role of the church. That's the role of this community. So here we go. Application point. Have two or three friends who are pursuing the same thing. Plain and simple. What, what do I do at this point? How do I, what's a great place to start with community? Find some people who are pursuing the same things in life. A great place to start is do they love Jesus? Okay, we're, we're, not, we're, not talking to, you know, we're not just talking about running a race. How are you going to successfully run a race this year in school? No, we're talking about how are you going to live your life with purpose and, and perseverance and longevity. Find a few people who are pursuing the same things. A great place to start is do they love Jesus? Right? Do they love Jesus? Because if that person loves Jesus, you know that they're going to hold you to a high standard of character in your life. And they're going to help build you and shape you and push you uh, to, to greater things. Cool? Am I going too fast? Okay, cool. So here's number two. Refuel with what is life-giving. Fuel up. Refuel with what is life-giving. So I was 
talking to these guys, my original point here was actually hydrate, what I wrote down, like hydrate, because I'm like, okay, yeah, you're running, you need to drink water, you need to replenish that. And as I got talking to them, I realized it's so much more than hydration, so much more than hydration. And so we changed this to fuel up. And, and here's a, a term I want to give you. In marathon running, there's a term called bonking. You can write this down, bonking. And it's essentially when there's nothing left in the tank and your body shuts down. So if you ever watch videos of people running and they come, ac- they come running across that finish line and their arms are flailing, you know what I'm talking about? You ever seen this? So their arms are fl- flailing and they look like they're going to completely fall over and their head's like spinning and they just look like a crazy man coming across the finish line. That's called bonking. And what it literally means is, is that their body is shutting down straight up. It means they have burned up every single energy reserve. They're pushing themselves mentally to get across that line, but there is literally nothing left in the tank physically, and their body is shutting down. And it's literally like going into convulsions as they go across the finish line. It's called bonking. And as a runner, you want to do everything you possibly can to avoid bonking. Um, Because essentially what happens, and I'm just giving you some terms here, as you're running, your body burns up carbs first. And then once it burns up all your carb reserves, it's going to start burning up your fats. As a runner, you don't have a lot of fats. So it quickly goes to proteins. Proteins is literally muscle groups. So when your body has burned up its carbs and its fats, it literally starts eating your muscles. And that's when bonking takes place and your body just shuts down. And so as as marathon runners are trying to get across this line and push their body to these extreme, uh, extreme levels, they have to practice what they call fuel ups. And essentially what they're doing is that while they run in, in, in progressively longer increments, they're practicing drinking, they're practicing eating energy sources. They actually have to eat during a race. Matter of fact, I brought some fuel ups. So there's different forms like Cliff Bar and Gatorade and Jelly Belly also make fuel ups. And essentially what this is, is like a, an energy packed little, this, this, these particular ones are jelly beans. And, uh, and literally in here is all kinds of like natural vitamins and a little bit of caffeine to give them a hit. And it's just supposed to help them refuel their body so that it delays the body beginning to eat the muscle. And it helps them get across that line and, and, and push a little bit harder in addition to drinking. But here's the thing. When they're in a race, they can't guzzle water. You can't, you can't just guzzle water. You, you practice fueling up. You practice drinking. Yes, you need to hydrate. Um, but when they're in a race, they're taking like small drinks of water because if you get a bunch of water sitting in your gut, you're going to get a rock in your gut too. Uh, and so it's more than just hydration. It's also fueling up. So I actually have, I've got packets of these and I figured we can just pass these around and everybody can take a, a jelly bean so that way you stay awake in the rest of this thing. So uh, just so you know too, uh, one whole serving is a a full package. So you're not going to go crazy eating one jelly bean, okay? Uh, These are, in case anybody needs to know, they are peanut-free, gluten-free, dye-free, GMO-free. So anything beyond that, you know your body, (laughs) all right? So so I'm just going to, you can tear open that pack, and uh, I'll just pass a few of these out. Get a jelly bean if you want one. I think they're black cherry flavor. Take one, pass the pack, and... uh, these are, these are legitimate, these are le- legitimate runner fuel ups, all right? So I'll just pass that back there. So now you can get a little idea. So literally while they're running, that runner's going to take some of these, take a small handful and pop them in their mouth, just suck on them and let that energy just slowly release into their body as they're, as they're cruising in this race, all right? So... Yeah, snag one, keep rolling. So, let me keep moving while you're while you're passing those around. Uh, look, look at Luke chapter eleven, verse three. It's up on the screen. Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray. And this one sentence, he says, give us this day our daily bread. It's like a daily portion. And the the Jews understood this going back to to the days of Moses in which they were traveling, wandering around in the desert, and God provided manna. 
and manna would come every single morning, right? It would, it would, it would come out, it would be available, like it would just fall from the sky and it, 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 would, it would collect on the ground like dew. And they would collect this flaky bread-like substance and they would eat it. But they couldn't store it. They couldn't hang on to it. They had to every day go and collect it. And, and so Jesus is saying, look, he, he was re- relating to that. He was like, every day you have to get your source of energy. You have to get your source of fuel. And it's not just about the meals you eat. It's about being in the presence of God. It's about sitting in his presence, soaking up his presence, soaking up his word, spending time in worship and in prayer. Every day getting that fuel up and practicing that. So when a runner goes to do a marathon he doesn't just go into it cold, like having never practiced, never stretched, never run 26 miles before, having never learned how to, how to properly balance hydration and fuel ups while he runs. All these things are things that he's practicing every day. So when he gets to the big race, his body already knows what it's supposed to do. There's a muscle memory that's built within his body. And at a certain point, his body's going to get thirsty and his body's going to get hungry and he's going to know how to balance those things. If you are every single day practicing fueling up in the presence of God, then when things get difficult, you're going to have a muscle memory that kicks in and it's going to help you press on when things get hard. You're going to have this muscle memory of scripture and truth coming to mind and, 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 and the presence of God just kind of flowing within you. There's going to be a, a joy that comes about you that's going to become your strength even when things are super depressing. Um, and so you have to practice being in the presence of God every single day as a fuel up so that when it really counts, your, your body, your muscle memory, your spirit memory knows what to do when things truly get hard, right? On the flip side of this, there can be overhydration. And we talked about like when a, when a runner drinks too much, they get like this rock in their gut. And you're like, well, okay, how can you have too much scripture? Here's how you have too much scripture. You can have too much scripture when you're doing nothing with it. You can, you can, you can, Take it in, soak it up, read the word, just fill up, fill up, fill up, and never pour out. And that you just become a stagnant vessel. You, you become useless in running. We're, we're supposed to daily fuel up and pour out and fuel up and pour out and fuel up and use that every single day. And so I would relate overhydration to being a Christian who sits in church every week, who reads his Bible but never does anything with it, never goes out, never witnesses, never takes a stand for what they believe, never applies what they've learned, and they're just soaking it all up and becoming a stagnant vessel. Every single day, you've got to be using it. I'm going to give you this visual, and we'll move on. And my crossfire peeps, you're going to recognize this. And I'm a lefty, so I'm gonna like do my art and then reveal it, okay? That's how that works. So you have, can everybody see that? Okay. So I believe that we have four tanks within us, four tanks. We have this like spirit man, and then we have our physical tank, our mental tank, our emotional tank. And everything that we do in this life pulls from these tanks. See how well this erases. Everything we do pulls from these tanks. You're doing things every single day that's physically expending energy. You're solving problems that is mentally expending energy. You're dealing with people that is emotionally expending energy. How many got some people around you who use a lot of energy, okay? And all of these things pull from what I would call your spiritual tank. They pull from your spiritual tank. As you spend time in the presence of God, as you spend time reading the Word, as you spend time worshiping God, your, your spirit man is being filled. And He's giving you the capacity to pour out in all these other things. But if you don't practice filling up here, and you've got nothing in this tank, eventually these tanks are going to run dry. And you're not going to be able to give yourself to people emotionally, You're not going to be able to uh, think through and process situations rationally. 
And eventually, when these two tanks, what I found is that when these two tanks right here run empty, it begins to drain your physical person. And you become depressed, and you become tired, and you become unmotivated, you become cynical. And the key to keeping these tanks full is keeping this tank full. Is keeping this tank full. And so that's what we're talking about today. When we talk about fueling up, it's about making decisions that fuel these, this tank. You can do things that fuel these, like you can hang out with friends. And that's going to fill up this emotional tank. It's going it's to put some, put some, but it's also probably going to simultaneously drain it. You could do things that, here's the difference between refueling and relaxing. The difference is that you can relax and do nothing to refuel yourself. Let me give you an example. I can come home from a frustrating day, and it's honest, I'll be honest with you, it's one of my favorite things to do. I can come home from a long day, and I can just like, oh, I'm just going to flip all the switches off. And I'm going to sit down in front of the TV, and I'm going to watch a movie, and I'm just going to immerse myself into something that is not real, and I'm just going to forget about the rest of my day. Okay? I'm going to relax. I'm going to chill for a little bit. But at the end of that movie, these issues still exist. And I've done nothing to address that. But I could go and I could... One of my favorite refueling things to do is to go fishing. I love to go fishing or I love to go on a walk in the woods and I could just pop in some worship music or just sing some worship music while I'm fishing. And, re- and it's literally, it's refueling this guy right here. And while my situation may not always change those difficult things I'm facing, my perspective on it will because I've been refueled. You see the difference? You can disappear into some sort of distraction but your problems are still going to exist and you're still going to have no way to deal with it unless you've been intentional about refueling the tanks, right? So I think we get it. Here's the application for us in this. Seek consistency in devotion and block some time for the things that fill your tanks. Some other verse references you can write down, John 4:14. 4, Whoever drinks of the water that I give will never thirst again. Romans 15, 32. So that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your presence. Paul knew that there was refreshing in the presence of the church. And he was like, I'm going to come and I want to be with you in your presence and get refreshed. If you're drained, one of the best places you can be is in the church. Don't isolate yourself. Don't, don't feel like, man, if I come to church, they're just going to think that something wrong with me. They're going to judge me. They're gonna, everybody's going to see it on my face. Just get in church. Quit making excuses. Be around people who are going to encourage you. Again, it comes back to that first thing of finding community. Being community. It's going to help you. All right, we got to keep, keep rolling. Number three, shred weight. Shred weight. Here's the truth. Added weight fatigues and trips you up. That's why I can't run. Out of weight fatigues and trips you up. I was talking to the guys about this. I was like, hey, give me, give me, give me something um, on this. And, and it was interesting to hear two perspectives of this because they both came to the same, same conclusion, but from opposite angles of this perspective. So here's the stereotype in running is to be as skinny as possible. Like you want to be as lean, zero fat, be as skinny as possible. That's like the stereotype to be a marathon Runner, but the trap is to start comparing yourself to other people. Start comparing yourself to other runners. So, this one guy, uh, I, like I said, I talked to two two guys who are marathon runners. One of them said it like this. He's like, you know, in college, I was, I was this, you know, super lean, super skinny, super fast runner. But he's like, I was looking at all the other guys on my track team, and they were like going to the gym, and they were getting buff, and they had six packs, and they had just good strong muscles. And I was like, man. They just look so much more healthy than I do. And so he's like, he's like, so I spent an entire semester bulking up and building weight and building muscle so that he's like, I just felt confident and not like skinny as a rail. He's like, but then I got to the race and I got to the starting line and he's like, I'm in position to run. And I look across the line and he's like, I was the biggest guy 
on the field. And he's like, it was the worst race of my life. He's like, I had put on all this bulk and he's like, I thought it made me look good. But he's like, I was carrying so much muscle, so much mass extra that I didn't need. It slowed me down. Meanwhile, I talked to the other guy. He's got a completely different build, completely different build. And he's a, he's a, he, not a big guy, not big like me, but he's, he's a tall guy. And so for him, like, for him, like 180 pounds is like, that's, that's, that's lean for him. Okay. He's a big guy. Whereas for the other guy, like 150 pounds is, so there's a 30 pound difference. And he, so he's looking at, he's like, man, I wish I was skinny like him so I could run faster. And he's over here like, man, I wish I could bulk up so I look better. And the, and the two have fell into this same trap of comparing themselves to, to other runners. And both of them in those comparisons ran the worst races of their life. And they came to this conclusion that they had to be in the healthiest place for them. The healthiest place for themselves. Here's the truth. Don't try to make your journey someone else's. Be who God is training you to be. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, since we're surrounded, I use this verse on Wednesday night, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and every sin that clings to, to us so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, um, who for the joy of, of that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What kind of application can you get from this? Get yourself into the healthiest spot for you and do the things that really matter. Don't worry about someone else's race, someone else's journey. Here's the amazing thing. We're all on the same race. This goes back to community. We're all on that same race going to the same destination. We're all on this race to heaven. But your journey on that track is going to look different than my journey on that track. You may be able to get past certain obstacles that I'm going to struggle with. I may be able to blow past things that you're going to struggle with. I may, able, may be able to get to a certain point in my life faster than you. But you may be able to get, you may be able to, get to the next phase faster than me. Everybody's journey in this life, everybody's journey in building character, everybody's journey in building discipline, everybody's journey with Jesus, everybody's unlocking the spiritual gifts within them. All of those things come at different times, in different seasons, in different phases, and it's exactly when God wants to do it in your life. Your job is to be the healthiest version of yourself as you possibly can be. To be healthy, mind, spirit, emotions, physically, to be healthy so that you don't disqualify yourself from the race. And God can continue to work in you with longevity and perseverance, through your longevity and perseverance. Here's number four. Set manageable and scalable goals. How do we get through difficult seasons in life? How do we cross the finish line? Look, let me tell you, uh, I just recently, I transitioned to a new job. I'm literally like two and a half weeks officially on the job. But I'm coming from a position of 12 years. Many of you know, I know many of you in this room. I was in the same spot, the youth pastor at an amazing church with an amazing group of students for 12 years. You don't get to where I got to 12 years of tenure and longevity without having perseverance. There were, so, I'm, I'm going to be straight up honest, there were so many moments where I wanted to just throw in the towel and quit. There was moments I came home and quit to my wife. And then I slept on it, woke up the next morning and had a better day. There, there were so many times where, where situations I was dealing with, whether it was with staff or with students or even just things, my own attitudes, there were so many moments where I was just beat down. But you have to, that's where, that's where this spiritual muscle memory kicks in. When you're tired, when you're worn out, when you're weary, you go to that place of rest, that place of refueling. You get around people who are going to support and encourage you. All these things matter to help you get, uh, build that longevity and, and, and continue when you want to quit, right? So setting scalable goals, uh, manageable and scalable goals. Here's, here's a sub-truth on that. Failure to plan is a plan to fail. 
In marathon running, there is a 12 to 18 week buildup with specific workouts before that race. And in that 12 to 18 weeks, they're setting extreme goals to push their body and push their mind to limits they previously couldn't achieve. And they're setting these goals and, and, and they're creating for themselves a track for success. So here's something you can write down. Get in the practice of seeing your goals through. You're not always going to hit them. And I think there's great freedom in that and knowing that, look, I may not always hit my goal, but I set a goal and look what I did accomplish, right? Don't be afraid to set a goal just because you're afraid you're not going to hit the goal. Because there's something to be learned. I, I, my friend Jonathan said it like this. There's still something to be gained in trying and failing. So even if you don't hit it, you've probably still learned something and you're still probably better for it. So set a goal, a target to reach. And make sure that it is something that you have not reached before. It doesn't have to be outlandish. Get yourself to this goal and then get to the next one. Right? But set a goal that is stretching you to achieve something you haven't achieved. And then the question comes up, what happens when it doesn't go my way? What happens when it doesn't go the way I thought it was going to go? I'll give you one word. And I talked about this on Wednesday night. Flexibility. Flexibility. Have for yourself, and I'm going to communicate this clearly, but have for yourself an A, B, and C goal. Now, I'm not saying have for yourself a plan B. Okay? There's a difference. I'm not saying throw yourself into this, throw yourself into this walk of faith, but have a plan B just in case it doesn't work out. What I am saying is this, set a goal for yourself, but also have another goal. So in the event that you have not achieved this goal, you have something to fall back to and still reach for. So it's like this, talking to the marathon runners. Uh, one of the guys was telling me, hey, he was hoping to run a sub, uh, a sub what do you call it, 240 marathon. So in other words, he was trying to run that marathon in under two hours and 40 minutes. Okay, that's his, that was his goal, 240 marathon. His secondary goal was this. If I can't hit 240, I want to hit 245 because that's still going to be a personal best. And if, I, if I'm just having a bad day and I fail at that, my C goal is to finish the race at all costs because I'm not going to quit. See what I'm saying? So he set this goal of, I'm going to achieve this. I'm going to hit this. This is the, 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 the desired uh, achievement. I want to reach for this. I want to I excel in X, Y, Z. But in the event I don't, here's my personal best, and I'm going to reach for that. And if the, in the event I don't, I'm not going to quit. Right? So it's not having a, 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 a plan B. It's just having something else to reach for so that you are always pulling yourself to the next thing when things get difficult. Uh, Proverbs 16, 1 through 4 says this, the plans of the heart belong to the man, but the, answer, uh, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything with purpose. We talked about that on Wednesday. Even the wicked day of trouble. So ask yourself, what does God want to do in my life long term? Because God has purpose and he's planned it. So I want my plans, I want my goals to align themselves with the will of God in my life. I don't want to be setting all these goals and then God's got this plan over here for me because chances are I'm just going to get frustrated trying to achieve my goals, right? So I'm going to take some time and I'm going to figure out what is the race God has me on whether it's, whether it's enduring a season in your family, whether it's uh, achieving something academically, or whether it's just the broad scope of living your life well, God's got a, a, a race that he's got you on. What are the goals that he has for your life? What is his purpose? Set those things. Don't go, don't go against the goals of God and start running your own race because you're just going to wear yourself out and get frustrated. You align those things. God establishes that plan. He blesses that plan. Um, and he's going to help you run that race. Look at the long term. So here's your application, and then we're on to our last point. 
Be intentional in what you do. How do, we, how do we set manageable and scalable goals? We want to be intentional in what you do and then celebrate what you have accomplished. This is important. A lot of times we, we beat ourselves up because we didn't accomplish this or we didn't accomplish that or we feel like we should be further along. We shouldn't be struggling with this attitude or this sin any longer and we just get frustrated with ourselves. But instead of getting frustrated with yourself, acknowledge what needs to change, what needs to grow, but celebrate where you are. What have you accomplished in this? This is, this is practically how you set those A, B, and C goals. Yeah, okay, so I may still have this attitude issue. My tongue may pop off from time to time, and I say things that I shouldn't say and I don't mean, but I've gotten a lot better. But I'm also now starting to speak faith into my life. Right? That's not a license to continue to do the wrong thing, but you can celebrate where you are. You see what I'm saying? Where you've come from. It's like this. Like I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be, and he's still completing me. Right? It's this process of growth and, and scalability in your life. So celebrate what has been accomplished in you. And then here's the last one. Run with the end in mind. Run with the end in mind. Focus on your why while doing your what. So in marathon running, they they like to say it like this. It's a 20-mile warm-up with a six-mile race. It's a 20-mile warm-up with a six-mile race. And they want to be able to steadily pace themselves through those 20 miles. So they can push themselves the last six to run the best they've ever run in their life. The word here is consistency. The goal is consistency. To to be a person of consistent character, to be a person of consistent attitude, to be a person of consistent faith, a person of consistent hope. So that when everything around you just seems to be failing just like a runner, they get to the last six miles. When everything around you is the hardest it's ever been, your mind, body, spirit know exactly what to do to give you the hardest push of your life. So you run with the end in mind. What is the goal? What is waiting for me at the end of this season? What is waiting for me at the end of this life? Think about that thing. Because here's what's going to happen. There's going to be a point in life where you're not feeling it anymore. The passion is just... It's not fun. It's not exciting. It's lost its its luster. It's just not doing it for you. But if you can connect to your pain, it'll push you to the end of the finish line. See, there's a point where passion fails but your pain won't let you quit. There's a point where you say, man, I'm so exhausted. I'm so, t- I'll give you a great example of this. Okay. Here's a great, I'll give you a great example right now here at this conference conference. There is a whole team of executive leaders who are running this conference who are physically and mentally exhausted. They've been going and going and going and going and going. And they're passionate about students. But they're also pained. They're pained because they don't want to see a single student miss the opportunity to know Jesus. They're pained at the thought of a student leaving here having not had an adequate presentation of the gospel and potentially going off and living their life all the way to hell. And that pain allows them to push beyond being physically tired. It doesn't matter how drained I am. I'm going to give it my all when I walk out on that stage because I love students and I can't bear the thought of not spending eternity in heaven with them. You see what I'm saying? So there's this moment where in your life, the things you're reaching for, they're going to seem out of reach. You're going to get tired. You're going to get sick of pushing. But if you can tap into why I'm doing that in the first place, why does it matter that I'm doing what I'm doing? 
that, that pain is going to push you to continue and finish well, right? And finish strong. So let me give you a scripture and the, and the final application. James 1.12 says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised, those, promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who is steadfast under trial, consistent under trial, strong under trial. If you know what's at the end, you can find joy in the process. So here's the application before we, before we pray and close. Pray for a clear sense of purpose and seek to be joyful in the process. God, why am I doing what I'm doing? What have you called me to? And then help me find joy in what you're doing. It, it, it's it's kind of like what Tori was talking about today, about that holy refining fire, and how it's hot and it burns and it exposes the, the impurity and the junk in our life, the things where our character kind of falls short. It exposes all that and burns it away and then just kind of exposes more and more. That's, that's a difficult painful process but we can find joy in it knowing God you are shaping me into something I have never been before into the greatest version of myself I I could possibly be so recap real fast five things to help you build longevity and perseverance in your life number one get in community number two fuel up be in the word uh, be, in the, be among other believers who are going to encourage you and, and uplift you. That daily bread we talked about. Number three, shred the weight. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of the excess. And be the best version of yourself you can be. Don't start comparing yourself to someone else's walk, someone else's journey. Remember, God's got them on a different path in the same race. Don't start comparing yourself. Uh, celebrate what you have achieved. Set those scalable goals, right? Uh, don't beat yourself up when you don't If you don't achieve a certain goal, just look at what you have done, how God has grown you, how he has stretched you. Celebrate those things and keep going. Keep pushing until you achieve that thing and achieve the next thing and the next thing. Uh, And then finally, run with the end in mind. Run with the end in mind. Focus on the why while you're doing your what. Cool? Sweet. Any questions? Awesome. Let me pray for you and we'll get out of here, get to lunch. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this incredible generation that you are raising up of leaders. God, I just pray that you would help us in in every season of our life, God, to to just lean into your presence. God, to, to allow the joy of the Lord to become our strength, God. I pray that we would just see what you are doing and take joy and delight in it. God, may we not beat ourselves up over where we think we ought to be in the process, but may we just trust you that you are shaping us and you are making us. And God, help us just every day to surrender, surrender ourselves, surrender our attitudes, our life, our decisions, our dreams, surrender it to you. God, incrementally, day by day, becoming the, 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 the version of ourself, God, that you have built us and designed us and dreamed us to be. God, so we can run this race with purpose, God, with intention, that we can cross the end of that finish line, not, not using a marathon term, not bonking, God, not ready to collapse and, and, and fail and everything shutting down, but God, may we be able to get to the end of this race of life, having run it well, Lord, uh, and, and, and still standing strong as we cross that finish line and enter into your presence, God. God, for, for my friends who are looking at a short race right now. They're dealing with, with a season in life and they just need a little bit of perseverance, God, in this, in this season that they're in, whether it's academic or in their family. God, I pray that you would help them to just focus. God, help them to connect to you, to fuel up. God, in your presence, bring people around them who can support and encourage them. God, let the church be the church. God, let the church be a place of, uh, uh, of love and, and, and gentleness and correction, God, and shaping and, and growing. Lord, a place of encouragement for one another that we can, that we can um, uh, just rise to this occasion, God, uh, that we can honor you with our life and the decisions that we make. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.